Hello, welcome to Ningen Report, your weekly roundup of all the latest Ningen news and all other photograph announcements that we found interesting. Skonsin here. This is Becky. It's number 93. Wow. Let's start with stock updates. Z9 is available everywhere again, or if it's not available, the lead time is about a week or so. But now we also talk about Z400, the 4.5mm lens. Yeah, that one's starting to turn up in stock now as well. We've got stock as of the time of recording. And if they sell out between now and when this video goes out, we'll probably have some more very, very soon. We know that's the case for other UK retailers as well. So presumably it's the case all over the big wide world. Whoop, whoop. Yeah. Um, aside from that, there are a couple of other items. People have, I think, mistakenly thought that the 402.8 is free stock because there's sort of headlines saying 400 mil now in stock. 402.8, the lead time is very, 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 very long. So unfortunately, that one isn't turning up. But other things are coming through, which is great. There's also Z600 Mila 4 apparently been released into the wild. Yes, not in the UK, unfortunately. We had some inside information that told us there weren't going to be enough 600 F4s to supply every single retailer with one unit. So that's sad. Looks like the USA once again is getting the lion's share. This also has a lot to do with obviously the exchange rate between the yen and the dollar. Generally, Nikon are making more money by sending stock to the USA. Making a killing over there. But if yeah. I ever release a video why I moved to United States, it's exactly just for this reason, nothing else. All right, let's move on to some firmware updates. We've seen two firmware updates this week, one for Nikon D6, which went from 1.5 to 1.51 version. What did they fix, Becky? They fixed the following issue. Taking pictures with enable selected for flicker reduction settings in the photo shooting menu with aperture stop down using either a camera control to which depth of field preview was assigned or the aperture stop down button on a PC lens would, in rare cases, cause the camera to stop responding with an ERR or ER display, uh, er, like dis uh, er, <laughs> displayed in the top control panel and viewfinder. So... The ERR message usually is attributed to some electronic fault. Sometimes it's a buildup of static electricity. Sometimes it's something more serious, like a motherboard failure. In this case, it's just a firmware issue. All right, so a couple of things to clarify. ERR means error, and PC means perspective control. That's right. Now, the other thing they fixed was double tapping the display to cancel playback zoom, like your double tap, would result in the monitor failing to turn off automatically following the delay selected for monitor off delays custom setting. Mm, interesting. So, yeah, so if you're used to that double tap, zoom in, zoom out, then suddenly your back screen would stop auto turning off, which was annoying. Last thing they fixed was sliding the VR switch to from on to off on a very specific lens on the AF 80 to 400, 4.5 to 5.6 D, which is an old school lens. Not the G one. Not the G. Would disable the autofocus on the camera to which the lens was attached. So obviously someone out there reported this very specific issue and they discovered that it was fixable via firmware. So there we go. Okay. Well, as usual, we love all the support for the older cameras. So we are eagerly waiting for Z62 and Z7 Mark II firmware. I can do this joke under every firmware release. You see what I mean? Should we do it under the Coolpix one? So there was also an update to the Coolpix P950 and they released firmware version 1.3. They fixed the following issue. Pictures taken using the multiple exposure lighten star trails option would be overexposed. Brain. That's yeah. annoying. Okay. Uh, and secondly, the camera would sometimes stop responding to all control inputs when photographs were taken in the continuous high 120 or 60 frames per second options, which I didn't realize the P950 had. So there you go. Fantastic. It's lovely that Nikon is supporting the old cameras as well. So we are eagerly waiting for Z62 and Z72 firmware updates. <laughs> I will now it gets old. Lovely stuff. You can download all those firmware updates in the links below and also make sure that your batteries are fully charged. Indeed. Now, next up, the Japanese Techno System Research published their latest digital camera global market share for 2021, not 2022. Yeah, so this is the interesting one because obviously we get this news now. It's published on Nikkei, you know, the favorite small financial blog that uh, said that Nikon is dying. They published this data and it's obviously the data for 2021, not for the year that we are in right now and it's almost December time. So let's have a look at this, but then let's 
speculate what Nikon done this year in terms of sales? Did they increase or decrease their shares? And what do you think will happen in 2023? So let's start with the share in 2021. So we are a year back. It's January 2022, and we're looking at the share. So Canon is first at 45.8% share. Sony is at 27%. Nikon is at 11.3%, and it's less 2.4% than 2020 year. Yeah? And then Fujifilm at 59 and Panasonic at 44 So let's look at this this way, yeah? So that year didn't have Z9. That's right. Z9 came out literally on Christmas 2021 and it actually started to get delivered in January. So that's number one. So I assume that the share of Nikon would increase this year just because they sold quite a few, even if the camera was out of stock. Correct. Now, the only problem with this is the other cameras that have been out for a while and due to refresh probably slowed down in the second half of the year in terms of sales. Now, what do you think Nikon should do in 2023 to improve the share, maybe increase it? Maybe I should ask you that question. I don't have an opinion. Well, um, I have an opinion. Go for it. Just like everyone on the internet. So first of all, we desperately need Z8. Whatever that is, let's not go there. But if we all hope where they are, and everyone has a different, obviously, opinion about Z8. But if we all hope that's the camera that we want, that basically will increase the sales. Because Z9 sales will slow down a little bit. It's going to be second year the camera is out. So, mm -hmm. you know, so, and it's now we're starting to see in the full supply, et cetera, et cetera. So Z8, we need that. But we also need Z6 Mark III and Z7 Mark III replacements as well, because people who have those cameras or who were thinking of buying those cameras, they're now thinking it's a time for the refresh. Obviously, we're going to talk about potential Z5 release. We can talk about Z50 Mark II and potential Z90 or AKG 500 sure. replacements. So all those cameras will definitely improve. But I say from what we kind of sure that will come out is probably Z6 Mark III, Z7 Mark III and Z8. So we're, we're looking at the, all the sort of semi-pro to pro cameras being next year as opposed to the consumer cameras. Is that what you're well, saying? Well, no, consumer cameras are going to be there and obviously they're going to sell in volume. The thing about this is we now have lists of people who are waiting for this new release of the Generation 3 of Shocking cameras. Shocking number of people waiting. Exactly. And if you look at our comments, which is, again, a small sample yeah. of people. So it's, again, it's not people, let's say, who buy in cameras from Mums Net Forum or, um, you know, going to Argus to buy those things. So that will shift volume. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, professional cameras, it seems to be, according to a lot of people, are in desperate need for upgrade. At least they think they are. They think. You know what makes it tricky to look at these numbers is the fact that they're a year old. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the whole point of this discussion. Yeah, it makes it very, very difficult to give a kind of projection as to where I think we might be at. I would hope that Nikon would have, based on what I see people are using out there. When we when we see those surveys and those cross sections of brands that people are actually using, not so much what's being shipped, I always see Nikon in a far stronger position than what these figures demonstrate. But this was done at a time before the Z9 had appeared when the most recent yeah. camera development was what, the Z62 and Z72 the year before, so... Yeah. So it is out of date. Yeah. Let's be honest, we are literally at the end of the 2022. Yeah. And in terms of this, we expect Z9 shifted those numbers. But what do you think is going to happen in 23? What, what do we need in 2023 to even improve on that position that is, let's say, that is set in 2022? I would agree with you that there has to be something in the the mid-range point between the Z7 II and the Z9. There has to be a camera that sits in that gap because just the cost difference alone means that there's a whole market of people that aren't able to buy a camera that they want. Yeah. And obviously we've speculated m many, many times on what we think those those cameras will be, so we won't mention that again. And here we're back again, another week, another speculation. But I do think that DX cameras need a little bit more support, so upgrading the Z50 would be a really, really good idea. Mm -hmm. Having our you know, D500 equivalent in the mirrorless system would be great. Makes sense. Particularly off the back of the fact that Nikon have now officially discontinued the MBD17, which was... A long time coming because the D500 was discontinued quite a while ago, but mm -hmm. the MBD17 we still had orders for, so they've now officially discontinued that and any accessories attributed to the D500 alone. So it would be good to see a mirrorless version of that and to just support that sort of entry market or that sort of prosumer market, which which is a little bit more, supposed to be a little bit more affordable than the full-frame cameras. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Z5, I think that needs an update. 
Z50 needs an update and uh, we need one more DX camera and a whole bunch of new lenses. Speaking of new lenses, yes, and it's interesting that question that Tom Hogan raised in the recent article saying why we hear a lot of people saying I'm switching to another system and the regular comments they say brand S does the different thing that brand N does mm. or A and B, you know, um, or brand C does this and that and then they talk about lens lineup. Yeah. And what puzzles me about lens lineup when they're talking about brand N is they forget about this whole F-mount system that is already there, which is available via FTZ adapter, which generally is done to make sure that there are no gaps. And then obviously the new lenses will come out. And I think we've seen quite a few lenses came out this year. We've seen a lot of lenses. And actually, if you look at the length of time it took to build the F-mount lineup completely yeah. to the, the kind of final standard, it, it took them a long time, took a couple of decades. So the fact that we've already got more than 30 lenses in the Z lineup when the system is only four or five years old is actually astonishing. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. And obviously, we will see more lenses coming out next year. Mm -hmm. And we all want lenses that everyone's asking for, like 200 to 600, the 8512s, you name it. From macro, long telephotos to extreme wide angles, as we said, 14 prime, maybe even 12 millimeter prime would be nice to have. Lovely. But we're really well into the completion of the system. And yeah. I'm sure that maybe it will take another two, two to three years to complete it. But it's not long, really. We can't really say that the lineup is very small at this moment, I mm. think, especially once you have the F mount lenses, which people tend to forget for some reason. Yeah. And those are very, very good lenses. Exactly. All right, let's move on to third party news. The TT artist announced a new 35 millimeter F 0.95 APS-C or AKDX lens for Nikon Z mount. It looks pretty. It looks very nice. It does match the aesthetics of the ZFC. So the fact that it's an APS-C lens and they put it on a ZFC is a nice pairing, I would say. Now, this is obviously a manual focus lens. It is a 35 millimeter, which is for almost roughly a 50 mil equivalent. It's a 0.95. It does look very small and tidy. In fact, from mount to filter rim it is only 43 millimeters long so it's not a big lens despite its wide aperture could be a pretty good setup you know people who like to shoot 50 that would be probably the one lens to get you know mm -hmm. and at the price 200 dollars it's pretty good not too shabby and it's 267 grams so it'll be yeah. nice and light i mean with all those things when companies like this release a very inexpensive lenses we kind of know what to expect it's not going to win any awards in terms of sharpness optical performance but it could be a very nice lens for people to start off with. Yeah. And also some people buy it for, let's say, maybe a vintage rendering, maybe a particular bokeh rendering, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so, it's got 10 diaphragm blades, so it could have quite nice bokeh, actually. Exactly. Be exactly. It'd be nice to look at it. But it wouldn't be, let's say, your ultimate 50 for DX or something no. like this. But at $200, it's not a big spend to try it out. Now, there's another company called Aster Hori. I call them Aster Hori. I don't know why. It's rumored to announce two lenses, so H5 1.8 for maybe Z mount. Astrori. A story. A it could story. be a story. Yeah, you never know. Um, the reason why I say Hori is because there's a Japanese brand Hori that makes all those fight sticks and the joysticks, and that's why I call them Astro Hori. I don't know that's why, right. but it's true. But they are room to now two lens. First one is H5 1.8. We don't have any info on this as of yet, just the image. From this image, it looks like it may be an auto focus lens. You never know. It could be a manual focus as well. But the second one, which is quite interesting, is 105 F2.8 tilt and shift macro lens. Ooh. And that one, we have a little bit more info on. Yeah, that one looks like it's going to be great for product photography and amongst other things. But we have some specs. So the focusing range, they say closest focusing distance is 11 centimeters or 11 and a half centimeters, which is nice. The aperture range is 2.8 to f22. It's made up of 13 elements in 10 groups. And what they've listed as having a two times macro capability with 360 degree rotation, pan and tilt. That's going to be a really interesting lens to look at, I would say. Yeah. So if it manages to tilt and shift on multiple planes on the same plane, I, don't quite, I can't quite see from the picture how yeah. it's going to work, but it looks very interesting. Exactly. And again, if you need perspective control lenses, don't forget about the FTZ adapter. Those well, four lenses, 19, 24, 45, and 85 are still available and will go on your Z-mount camera. So They are, and the 45 and the 85 are both macro lenses with one-to-one -one reproductions. Yeah. I mean, there's also bellows available for Z-mount. They're made by Novoflex, yeah. and they allow for certain tilt and shift. Yeah. 
So, you know, you can you can look into those as well. So there are options available, and obviously we're all looking for the native options for Nikon Z mount as well. Now, another company called Pergear, mm -hmm. they are releasing 35 1.4 full frame lens, which costs only $129. That's pretty amazing. This is another manual focus lens. So I think that seems to be, you know, with these cheaper lenses, they're not putting any autofocus technology in there, keeping it really simple. It's a full metal construction with an aperture of f1.4. It does have a clicked aperture ring, which is quite nice. Again, another lens with 10 aperture blades, so it could produce some very nice bokeh potentially. The weight is only 245 grams, which is very good. Yeah, it's pretty good. Again, something to put on the camera and, you know, could potentially be as your street setup with a bit of zone voxing. Something I've read on the internet, and I could be wrong on this one, but uh, the company Lens Rentals in their podcast, they said that a lot of those companies, Chinese manufacturers, they're effectively reusing the legacy designs of all those prime lenses from big manufacturers mm. that, that the patent basically has run out and now basically you can use those patents. Before. So effectively, a lot of those lenses are those legacy designs. So, you know, could, could be that this lens as well, could be not, but it's interesting to know. So maybe some Sometimes when well, the original lens is potentially difficult to find, yeah. maybe one of those lenses will replicate that design as well. Exactly. Now we also have seven artisans who launched an EF NZ lens adapter. This is an autofocus converter ring compatible for the Canon EF or EFS lenses onto Nikon Z mount cameras. So if you're one of those people that maybe has a hybrid of two systems or you're a Canon user that stumbled across our little Nikon channel and you're thinking, oh, quite fancy one of those Z cameras that they keep talking about, then there is an adapter now with autofocus capabilities just for you. That's true. In fact, there are two adapters now. So one obviously from Seven Arts and, and one we talked about about a month ago. And I think it's either came from Megadap or Tech Art. So check on that as well. But it's good to have options and maybe different price points as well. Exactly. Now, Jill Optics. This is an interesting piece of news, but Jill Optics have rehoused the Nickel ED 50 to 300 mil f uh, sorry T 4.6 cinema lens. Now the 50 to 300 actually. It's not the 55 to 300 DX lens no. that a lot of people think of. It's actually a fairly old lens. It's an ED and it's 4.5. Now. Here's the thing, the 50 to 300 is one of those lenses that has a bit of a cult following amongst cinematographers. In fact, I have dealt with a number of cinematographers who have bought this lens because it produces this quite exquisite rendering for video work and because of its flexibility with the constant aperture. It's not small. It is about this big, so it weighs a ton. Chunky. It is a chunky monkey, but GL Optics have rehoused it and then they've improved the closest focusing capabilities after rehousing. Um, they've created it so it's got this 136 millimeter diameter filter thread with mm -hmm. an inner focusing system and a focus rotation of 330 degrees, much like the knocked. 58 yeah. mil that we tried out the other day. And you know what? It's 4.7 kilograms. That's a, it's a heavy lens. It's much heavier than actually the Nikon version with a price of $9,500. So keep that in mind. But they did improve the closest focusing distance and they also added completely new diaphragm, which is 15 blades now. So beautiful. Obviously, all those rehouse lenses will cost maybe five, maybe 10 times the price of the actual lens. Yeah. Just have a look like the easy example, of probably one of those Soviet lenses, Helios lenses, mm. where you can buy on eBay for 50 pounds, but rehouse version would cost you something like over a thousand pounds or something like this, yeah. you know? So, but obviously there's a lot of work goes into this and those lenses are being used for feature films, productions, et cetera, et cetera. That's right. So actually nine and a half thousand dollars for a lens is not that much when you've when you look at the budgets True. of equipment budgets for some of those bigger productions. Exactly. If you look at the blockbusters, you're looking at, what, 200 million plus? Easily. Next up, we have H&Y Filters, who have released a new Swift magnetic adapter ring for the Nikkor Z1424 2.8 lens, which is compatible with the Revering magnetic lens filter system. Now, this is an interesting one because Nikon do have a filter system and adapter for their 14 to 24, which is... No, I would say not necessarily the most sort of ergonomically in the field friendly system, mm. but it does exist. The filters for it are also vastly expensive if you buy the Nikon genuine articles. However, this magnetic filter system allows you to put the adapter on the front of the lens and then basically quick change your filters. 
Yeah, that's right. It supports 100 millimeter filter holders, as well as you can put magnetic mud box for videography as well. Nice. So you can do things like this. But you know, those magnetic filter attachments are all in the work right now, isn't it? Yeah. So, so it's very interesting that a lot of companies are releasing this. I don't know. Yeah. It just happened literally within this year or so. Yeah, because we, we got in a Kenko one, didn't we? That's true. That's yeah. true. We tried out the Kenko Quick Magnetic. And it's great if you've got to change your filters really quickly. One just comes off and the next one goes on and you don't have any fiddling about while you're in the field. So um, I, I'm excited to see what else comes out That's and more true. affordable options as well. But you know what my worry is always? I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like if I'll take the lens out of the bag or something like this, that it will just kind of, you know, the fields can come off or something. Yeah. Like I have this, you know, uh, feeling, but I don't have like a day-to-day -day experience. We try this in the shop for like a day, mm. it's not exactly, let's say, a month using a day to day or something like no. that. So, so I want to see how strong they are and how good they are. But at the moment, I'll wait maybe another year to see what, what people say and then maybe eventually we'll try them out. So. Now for some reviews, we have Photography Life who have published a Nikon Z 404.5 VR S field test article. All right, what do they say, Lakin? So the conclusion is, to paraphrase, while they have a few complaints about the 400, that's not to say it is or isn't the perfect telephoto lens for everyone. You may be more in need of a 100 to 400 or an 800 6.3 or one of the exotic super telephotos, but it strikes a great balance for wildlife photographers. The person who wrote the article said, I consider it Nikon's best general purpose wildlife lens since at least the 505.6 PF, maybe ever. Now, I've seen some other articles out there in the world, and the general conclusion is that it is remarkable for the size and also the price point of it, because it is only three and a half thousand pounds in comparison to some of the other lenses, which are much more expensive. Saying that, it's not it's not a 70 to 300, you know, it's not a sort of like entry point lens yeah, for I a mean, lot of people. You can always find a fault with any sensor. So you say, well, this is perfect lens for everyone. And someone says, well, I can't afford it. Yeah. Or some people say, but I have 402.8. Yeah. There's really no way to please everyone in a way, but uh, you know, there's no way of pleasing everyone in a way. That's great sensors. Yes, okay, three and a half thousand pounds. There's a lot of money to spend for the lens, but if you're a wildlife photographer, potentially, it's a really good value for money for what you're getting by spending this. Yes. But if you're occasional photographer, you probably don't need that lens because if it's sitting in your cabinet, let's say for years, yeah. then three and a half thousand pounds is a big outlay. So. That's right. And I think if you are an occasional telephoto photographer, something like a 100 to 400 is going to be far more flexible for you than a fixed 400 prime. That's always worth bearing in mind. Exactly. Speaking of very expensive lenses, we're going to move to We Can Read and Watch section where we reviewed... Nikon knocked 58 0.95 lens and it is a Nikon beast. It is. I wish that we had been able to shoot at night with it, but we don't generally shoot videos at night time. <laughs> so it's not very conducive to videoing, but we should have taken some shots at night. One day. One day we will get one back from Nikon. Exactly. In the meantime, we have Sharpness Showdown, Nikon 600TC versus 800PF versus Sony 600EM and the Nikon 600F4E. By Steve Perry. Yes, now Steve Perry knows his stuff when it comes to wildlife photography and he has obviously got and used all of these lenses. So that's well worth a watch if you find the telephoto stuff interesting. If I can also add, he is the master of YouTube covers. Yeah, we should it. get there. We should just use monkeys with open mouths and the lenses from now on. Brilliant. Million views. <laughs> and then we have Tom Hogan with a very interesting article, which is called Busting the Burnout. He talks about photography burnout and how to deal with it and escape that if possible. Do you have photography burnout, Becky? I do get it, yeah? actually. I, I do get it quite often where I just yeah. think, you know what, I don't want to take any pictures now. I just will not. Do you just disconnect your phone, disappear from work, and we don't see you for months? Is that what no, happens? No, the so thing is that the channel forces me to take pictures even when I <laughs> maybe don't want to. But it is it is worth reading because you do get that sometimes. You think, well, maybe I'm just not going to take pictures. Obviously, if it's your job, if it's your living, sometimes it's one of those life or death situations almost literally where you have to take pictures to feed your family and keep the lights on but it is a phenomena that i think all creatives experience at some point or another that's true very very interesting read and now we're going to show you a picture of a frog legged leaf beetle by yusuf al khapshi which was taken for nika small world 2022 photomicrography competition and this this creature 
is absolutely terrifying. I mean, you do not want to mess with this guy. And this creature lives in a garden next to you. Holy smokes. So that next is... time you see him, run. That is really something. Okay. And that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us this week. Yes, thank you very much for watching and or listening. Please give us a like and a subscribe if you're on YouTube. If you're listening on a podcast platform, give us a rating, a review, perhaps a follow. I don't know. There's things you can do on those podcast platforms. Yeah, and we hit appreciate all those bells buttons on the podcast platforms all because if you can find them, obviously. But just so you know, we're available on Apple Podcasts, mm. Spotify and Amazon Music Unlimited and all other respected podcast platforms. So do find us, listen us in a plane, in a car, wherever you are in the world at that time. Right. And if you'd like to find us on the internet, I am at Rebecca underscore Danese. The shop is at Nikon at Grays. And I'm at Konstantin Kochkin. Sometimes we publish the samples of the images we've taken with the lenses we review or some cameras, etc., etc. So do check them out as well. Yes. And we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Nice.